The first time I visited Petra, I inadvertently woke a Bedouin wrapped in a blanket as he slept beneath the stars on a natural terrace. He offered to be my guide to the old city. That very evening, he invited me to meet his tribe known as the Bidul. Since then, I have returned every year. With them on foot or riding a donkey, I have explored the steep trails beneath the mountains. Thanks to them, I have discovered the silent sculptures in the cliff faces. I have shared their seasons, their homes, and their desert. These nomadic seasons, these houses hewn from the rock, this desert where time and space are as one. I had always believed that Petra was an abandoned city. The Bidul told me that they all lived in these caves until they were hounded out just 30 years ago. Each time I go, I meet up with Bisma. Together we move to the rhythm of Bedouin life, where the day is devoted to the collection of wood, food, and water. Come on, Rashid. Time to get up. Where are you, Remy? She put the rice and sugar in the new larder. Stay in bed, Awad. Come on, Rami. It's seven o'clock, Rashid. Get up and go to the monastery. Leave me alone. Get up. <laughs> Don't you spill that water, young man. I'm not going to spill the water. Why are you washing your feet here and not at the well? <laughs> Before, we all used to live in the caves. We used to fetch wood, fetch water with our sheep. Everyone came together, and we had evening gatherings. It was much better than it is now. We used donkeys to bring the water. We used to go and fetch wood. We used to weave, cook on a wood fire. We washed. Our life was better. Then they were driven out of Petra, all of them. Everyone was driven out of the caves. And they left, and they got nothing in return. No land, nothing. Now they're trapped, packed in like sardines. The Bidul tribe's chieftain, Sheikh Salama, is the beating heart of this film. I listened to him for hours as he told me of his tribe's history. He agreed to talk to me, something he had always refused to do before. We lived in Petra before the state of Jordan was created. Our existence in Petra dates back maybe hundreds of years. I don't know. No one is sure of the exact date. We farmed the land in and around Petra and had a few sheep. Everyone knew what was theirs. If someone tried to steal someone else's property, they'd get shot. It was all done amicably. This is mine, that's yours. You've marked out this piece of land, that's yours. I've marked out this one, it's mine. During the winter, the Bedouins stayed in the caves, and in the summer, they would head into the desert. The sheikh told me that Petra was perfectly suited to their semi-nomadic lifestyle and that the Bidul would supplement their income by offering lodgings to passing tourists. But an event in the early 1980s would throw their lives into turmoil. Jordan requested that Petra be classified as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Mm 
la genèse du patrimoine mondial classé, c'est... World Heritage Classification has its roots in the 1972 Convention concerning the protection of the world cultural and natural heritage, which was adopted by UNESCO's member states as an international standard, allowing them to protect sites considered to be of value for humanity as a whole. Pour l'humanité tout entière. However, what I can say is that some preliminary actions were taken before the site was inscribed, which is uh, the establishment of uh, a, a management plan, as well as the, the relocation of part of the Bedouin population outside the park, which at the time was considered to be uh, a, a good, uh, a good uh, action, both by UNESCO and by the government. The governor of Ma'an, His Excellency Shahir El Muazna, came to see us. We prepared a meal in his honor and everything. And while we were eating, he said, do you know why I'm here? We said we didn't. He replied, I'm here to get you out of Petra. I said, fine, you are our guest, eat. He ate, and then he asked, how do you respond to that? I answered, our response? What do we get in return? You're going to make us leave here just like that and leave us with nothing? Is it necessary to evict people to protect a monument? Soon afterwards, he came back to tell us that the state was going to build homes for the Bidul people. Where? That remained to be seen. The entire Bidul tribe agreed to this as long as the homes were built around Petra. Umsayun was chosen, as it is close to Petra and it would be easy to come and go. Iskan al Bidul, the village of the Bidul, was built in 1984 to the north of Petra on the edge of the UNESCO protected park. But the Bedouins preferred to call it Um Sayun, after the hill it was built on. Our compensation was to be to live in Um Sayun and that all our demands would be met. Those who owned sheep, camels or horses would have shelter for their animals. And every child, on reaching adulthood, would be given a 500 square meter parcel of land where they could build and prosper a little. I told the prefect that if we were to leave Petra, our jobs, businesses and all our souvenir shops had to be safeguarded. He agreed. We were very happy because it secured the future of our children for a hundred years or more. Reassured by the terms of the bargain, the first families left their cave dwelling for houses in Um Sayun. On the 6th of December 1985, UNESCO inscribed Petra on its World Heritage Register. The site passed from Bedouin hands into those of the whole human race. But things were about to get more complicated for the Bidul tribe. They took our land, but we got nothing in return. They took our caves, but they only ever built the first batch of houses. For this reason, Salman still lives in Petra's caves. He's never far away, but it sometimes takes me several days to find him. I ask his cousins, his neighbors. I finally found him by the spring with his wife and five children. Can we work here? Mum will be here soon. She's not far away. Here she comes. Hi. 
Some homes were built, but not enough for all the bidul. Some of them were given houses, while others got nothing. The ones who ended up with nothing stayed in Petra's caves. I stayed in Petra because I had no home, nowhere to live. They don't want to give me a roof over my head, nor any land to build a house on. So what am I supposed to do with my children? Where can I take them without anywhere to live? Reassured by the site's newfound status, international missions organized a census and the protection of the buildings. Archaeological digs uncovered new monuments from the sands. Petra became one of the world's most highly valued places. During the 1990s, the number of visitors rose from a few dozen to hundreds of thousands every year. Hotels and a tourist infrastructure flourished in the area, providing jobs for thousands of people. An independent authority was established in the neighboring town to administer the site, the Petra Development and Tourism Region Authority, or PDTRA. The Bidul, meanwhile, showed good faith by adapting to their new lives. The site's shops were shared out among the various family clans. Their pastoral traditions made way for the tourist trade. This small shop at the heart of Petra belongs to Ismael and his family. Ismael has managed to reap the benefits of tourism and grow his business, all the while preserving his Bedouin identity. These shops, we have them from my grandfather, from my father, and now we have them. People of the village, the leaders, they have uh, talking with the Ministry of Tourism to share the business, like each 10 families, nine families together, and make them nice. And it was the agreement with them to have like a big space to cover because these shops, they're going to cover like 10 families, nine family. You are talking about uh, 110, 115 person, these families. It's like a short it is together. In the beginning with this project was, we are so happy for that because we're going to show people we have very nice things. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We hope you are enjoy it. All the best. Bye-bye. Menal is Bisma's daughter. She lives in the village, but she often spends the night with her mother in the cave. I met her on the road that leads from the Bidul village to Petra. We had a chat, and she invited me to take tea in her shop. Nowadays, I call her Ukti, Arabic for my sister. I love her freedom, her sense of humor, and her boldness. You like Petra? Sorry? Do you like red? Yeah, yeah, I do, yeah. You look very nice. You look real man with the red. Just a minute. Okay, do your grass. Yeah, oh. fine, fine. You look very handsome, my friend. Mm. <laughs> this one here. 
here and that one here. They look very nice, you see? Nice. No, yeah, this yeah. is for old people. Oh, is it? You know, oh. this is for people 80 years old, they use this. <laughs> He's a young man. Okay. He shouldn't use this. You use it for hair, my oh, okay. friend. Oh, okay. Use it for what? <laughs> use it for what? He use it for women, you know, in our culture. We use this to hit women. Oh, no. When the man gets angry, the old man, crazy no. man. Oh. Really, yeah, that's what we do. Beautiful gift here, girls, local made. I've been working here for 12 years. The shop belongs to my family. My brother, Sliman, works here with me. Petra is magnificent. Petra is a beautiful, wild, natural place. Wherever you travel in the world, you will never find a place like this. I was born in a cave in Petra. I love Petra because it's peaceful, because people come here from all over the world. My life and Bedouin life here is very pleasant. Petra is something that I can't define, something difficult to express in words because I'm a child who was born and grew up here. Three looking guys here, local maid if you're interested. No English. No English, Espanol? Espanol. Este es Mikael Camino, mirar gratis aquí. The impact has been probably very positive in the beginning because it attracted tourism and attention towards the site and uh, conservation works have been implemented here. Uh, but uh, due to the interest in the region, which has been developed uh, from the, the 90s onwards up to 2010, the visitation rates at the site increased more and more. Petra's inauguration as a World Heritage Site gave it a global visibility which, paradoxically, is a threat to it. It is part of the secondary, even perverse side effects of the UNESCO Convention. Look in front of you. The monument that you see was carved between the first century BC and the first century AD. UNESCO and the experts who work alongside it have an answer to this, which is to say, tourism needs to be regulated. And achieving this means an arm wrestle between UNESCO and the Jordanian authorities. But UNESCO cannot act independently from nation states because there is an issue of sovereignty. UNESCO does not overrule the state and it is not in a position to be at loggerheads with the state's leaders. Unfortunately, the government is uh, more interested in uh, trying to um, absorb as much as possible tourists as much as possible in the site rather than respecting the environment and uh, the, the, characteristic, the characteristics that make this site so special. Hoping to get his point of view, I contacted the director of the PDTRA. He agreed to meet me, but never actually made it happen. Tourism has risen to a level where it is now a genuine threat to the site. 
Petra partly welcomes a blend of cultural tourism and mass package tourism. A lot of people come to Petra and pay it no more mind than they do to their cruise across the sea. They come and spend a couple of hours here on their way from Aqaba because it's a stop off on their cruise. So it's really consumer tourism, which shows no interest in the site itself or in its historical context. None. No. Okay, at the count of three. One, two, three, open your eyes. Oh my God. Perfect timing to arrive here. Ah. <laughs> They have to be cautious in whatever they do because this is not a site as the other site. It's unique and it's not uh, tourism who should be the priority. The priority should be the site itself. At the same time, it is obviously very difficult for countries who are seeking an influx of foreign currency because they do not have prosperous economies to suggest to those countries that they limit the number of visitors they allow to come to these incredible sites. As sheikh, I represent the people and the state. I welcome everyone who comes to Petra. I do my utmost for them to be happy, and the Bidouls too. We treat the tourists as if they were our friends. Each of us has many friends all over the world, thousands of them. Torn between the state's priorities and those of UNESCO, the Bidoul who work on the site struggle to maintain their tradition of hospitality. Stocking his shop is a logistical nightmare for Ismail. He despairs of the absence of dialogue with the local authorities. First, I want to talk about the water problem. It's very important. We fall jerkins from our house, from the village, and we put them in a the car, and we take them down, then we take them back. And this is a take us, like, using the car sometime, two, three times, just to get the water. We have a pipe down in Petra, goes giving surfaces for the bathrooms and for the lustrants. And uh, we have been asked many times to have uh, water for our shops. Even the pipe of water is busting like 10 meters in front of uh, our shop. And always when we've been to the offices, always they get the UNESCO as the reason for anything we need as a surface in the site. We thought before as the, the UNESCO the one behind all these things. But then in the end we found it's only the government here they take the uh, UNESCO as a reason for them. I'm getting off here. Who's with you? Abu Nazel, let's go. We are using the generator, we are bothering the tourists, uh, and this is actually one of the things we don't like inside the area. Each shop, they have a very huge, big generator, and this is sometime when you enter the sea or the treasury, you don't find the silent. 
as a tourist you come you want a place silent quiet nice and really uh, we have no other solution only to use the generator you know they should have all these things fixed i am not understand how they don't care about the site because the surface i give in my shop this is not gives to myself or to my family this is also gives for the help of the tourism and also the country and in this way, if we need a big number of tourists, first we have to look to the surfaces. road snaking through the mountains links Umsayun to Petra, but the tourists do not know it exists. It is only used by the Bedouins heading to and from the site. I have often set off on foot and arrived on the back of a donkey or a camel with Ahmed, Sliman Fatma, or Abdallah. This road is above all a place to meet, banter, and have a laugh. The Petra Authority is planning to widen the road and turn it into a carriageway for the hundreds of buses bringing tourists here. They will go through the Bedouin village and drop the tourists off in the next town. Some Bidul are immune to tourism's ample charms like Saad and his family. They moved away from the tourist area with their herd and feel quite isolated up here in the mountains. In order to find them, I have to follow a track for several kilometers. Once I get close, the goat's bells lead me to them. I don't work with the tourists. I hate all of that. What can I tell you? Praise be to God, I have a house in the village. My son lives there. I have 30 or 40 goats and a lovely old wife who's about 70 years old. We moved away from the village for the good of the herd. Have you seen the village? How can anyone live there? Where can you go with this heat? You can't just sit around in a room all day. It doesn't make sense. Out here in the desert, you can sit under a tree, under a rock. You can sit wherever you like. <laughs> And from my house over there, I can't see my goats. I don't feel comfortable at all when I can't see my land or my crops and my herd around me. If I can't see all that, I don't feel right. I'm not happy. I can't relax. I don't like it. I swear there's no room in those places. I tell you honestly, you couldn't even raise a chicken in there. As you've seen, you take one step and you're in the street, in the middle of the road. If a child goes out, it could be dangerous. There's a main road on that side. The house is built between two streets. Since 1951, I've spent my life outdoors, just like all Bedouin nomads. We travel, we move around. I go wherever I like, but my house is here forever.
The Bedouins, we have the freedom life. That means nobody can control us, our life. Like a bird who can go to any place he wants. We move in the desert, we go to any place. Uh, this is, we have the freedom. And this is a kind of uh, Bedouin's life. If you go like to the desert, you find people with camels. You go to the mountains, you find people with a goat. Like sometimes I have my goat when I have nothing to do here. I can take my goats to the mountain, to the spring. I find it fun. That means uh, I love my culture, I love the Bedouins because we have this culture, and I will keep this culture not for me, for my generation and for the other. And we hope not our culture change because we are mixed with, um, with the tourists and the culture. But I think everybody, they understand this. At the end of the day, the tourists happily return to their hotels. This is time for the Bidul to reclaim Petra. Hello, how are you? Is there any tea going? Yes, I've made some. Oh, pour us one then. Go and make sure the donkey's tethered. Here. Go and get me some barley and salt. I'll give this to the sheep, Mum. My mother was born in Petra. When the government asked the people living in Petra to leave, to move into the village, because Petra was becoming a tourist site, my mother refused to leave. She would find living in the village too difficult. She likes being here. Her life is here. I want nothing to do with Um Sayun. I want to live here in Petra. It's better here. No one bothers you and I feel comfortable here. Tell her I want to stay here till the end and that when I die, I want to be buried in Petra. Had the tourists been here before, Mum, or was this the first time? Yes, many times before. And you used to put them up? Yes, they used to stay with us and then leave. But you didn't speak English? No. I prefer my life in Petra since when we lived there. 
Really, it's very hard life, but I like it because this village is not my style of life. Even we have uh, the power, the, we have the TV, satellites, these things. These things is not important and it's not from my life. The size of our village is not that big space. You are talking about like a small island. There is no space. You see, from the west is mountain. From the south is Petra. From the north, uh, from the east, also is a mountain. We have only the north direction. Uh, this is the land they promised us to give it us for in 1983. But we have uh, like uh, two or three kilometer the south of the village here. This is the one they promised us to give like uh, land for the people, but we still, we don't have it. I mean, we still not have it. The village limits confine the Bidul to 900 meters by 300 meters of land. In order to house their children and grandchildren, they have only one solution, to build extra floors on the houses. Um Sayun is growing taller. In terms of height of buildings in the, in the village of Um Sayun, yes, there are limitations. The building shouldn't be higher than, than two floors, but many of them um, have, uh, are already three floors high and, and some even higher. This is because uh, the, the village is very close to, to the site and is very visible. So the, it has a high visual impact on the, on the World Heritage Site. Um, therefore, uh, guidelines were embedded into the, the urban regulations uh, for, for the village but they're not always respected due to the um, expansion to the natural expansion of the population which is living in the village this is for mum where is she over there where is your mum we want your mum to come here we don't want her cheese we want her I live in Petra, deep inside Petra, so that I have somewhere to live a long way from the tourist trail. My herd, my kids and I moved away from the tourist trail so as not to ruin Petra's image with the tourists. We made an effort because we are loyal, but no one has helped us. We try to do things so that the tourists are pleased with us and leave here happy. We respect the tourists because thanks to them, we can cater for our children's needs. And we don't want to give the state an excuse to evict us but the state doesn't respect us. It doesn't even see us. The truth is that they want to move us away from our home. They want to drive us somewhere else. That's their objective. It is clear that the Bidul are a hindrance a hindrance for the local villages because they have exclusive rights to jobs on the site. A hindrance for the local authorities because their presence hampers their projects to expand the tourist industry. And a hindrance to UNESCO because their village sits on the buffer zone that it would like to establish around Petra. The approach was very different from what it is now. A measure that was taken in the 80s uh, would not apply at all now. Uh, UNESCO has changed uh, completely and there are more broader understanding of the importance of communities in relation to heritage sites. 
It has to be said that at the time of the 1972 convention, at least when it was being formulated, archaeologists and architects, specialists in world material heritage were also involved. Other opinions were expressed by people who were more concerned with human cultures, ethnologists, anthropologists, and intellectuals who said it's not just about heritage, it's also about popular culture. When we talk about Petra, we don't talk only about uh, uh, the, the Nabatean system or uh, the, the architecture of the, of the tombs in the site, but we talk also about the living population who is here and is uh, an integral part of, uh, of the site itself. We were born in this land, and we will die here. There will be nobody better to replace us in Petra. <laughs> the smoke's blowing this way. Oh! <laughs> We believe in the uh, in the idea of um, uh, of the communities to be an added value for for a heritage site. So uh, because they are the people who live close to a heritage area or within the heritage area itself, and they can be also the the best uh, to be able to protect that heritage. So we can say unequivocally that the influx of tourists over the last 40 years has been more detrimental to the site than the presence of the Bidul Bedouins would have been if they had been allowed to stay here after its classification. There's no doubt about that. In all cases, uh, uh, this are, uh, um, uh, the site will never go back to what it was when it was inscribed in the World Heritage List, when there were no tourists coming here, uh, nobody knew about it. And, uh, and there were, it was probably also better preserved. UNESCO's experts, fascinated by the monuments, tried to protect Petra. In 2006, they extended the protection to include the Petra Bidul and Wadi Rum cultures. Meanwhile, the inhabitants on Um Sayun are still waiting for those experts who will recognize the upheaval caused to their lives by the site's inscription as a World Heritage Site. We were hounded out of Petra. We were separated from our shops, our means of survival, our vineyards and the lands which fed us and which we lived on. And we got nothing in return. So what do we do? Do we emigrate? Our only solution is to emigrate. Nobody understands how much our people have suffered. Now I can't say anything. Why? Because those with nowhere to live outnumber those who live in Um Sayun. We believed the state, but it betrayed us. Now it's all open for the Bidouls. If anyone wants to return to Petra, they might as well just come back. Sheikh Salama has been trying for 30 years to get his tribe what they were promised. I've often seen his eyes fill with tears as he speaks because he feels responsible for the fate of his people. He's weary but supports the new generation which has taken up the baton. While we were filming, I witnessed a protest movement of young homeless people. That morning, they demonstrated in a tent in Petra in full view of the tourists. In the evening, they headed to their parents' caves with their wives and children. It was then that I met Atala. We agreement with our government before we moved from the cave here to have a land and every person, and when he's 18 years old, he get a land, but now I am 31 years old and I never get a land. All the land from there, they say the government, it's for the UNESCO. 
and the other land it's for the other town, the farmer people, you know. We say, okay, where our land, where the land you promised us, you promised our father and grandfather to give us. Where is the land then? Why you say that before when you move us from Petra, after that you say there's no land? Why you move us, you know, from there, this place? We are Arab. The Arab people, he have four and five children. Every guy have four or five children and he's living with his mother and father, you know, and the house from the government, it's only two room, one, ca one kitchen, one bathroom. It's where you want to sleep, just we sleep outside really. Yesterday we agree all our, the people in the village to go down to our cave where we born because we don't have any house to live. لا هذا لك قدام يا ولد قدام قدام هذا ما ينزل معي جار كبير سيارات This my cave where I born and this all of it's for my family, this one and this one and we have the system up there for the water to bring the waters and we have the toilets, it's down just here. And now I'm coming back with my children, even with my brother who we used to live together in one house. The government, they don't want us to live inside the cave. In Petra here, in this area, it's protecting the area. But okay, we agree with them. We agree with them. This is area for tourist protecting area. But it's where the place we born, where we lived. And it's our land, our grand-grandfather lands. They give us the village there, a small village with just 200 house, there is, it's not enough. They get, we want the land to build the house. We don't want them to build for us the house. They get, want them just only to give the land and we make the house. <laughs> Alongside these men and their families, I experienced their joy at being able to return to Petra and their hope of getting some land. Fearing the tourists would see the situation getting out of hand, the authorities promised to find a solution within a month. The following week, all of the families headed back to the village. I wanted to believe as much as they did. Unfortunately, nothing had changed. Here in Petra, man has reshaped the cliff faces, just as the cliffs have reshaped man's spirit. Petra is a vast, wild, open and barren place. It has nothing to offer but the boundless freedom of a nomadic lifestyle, where man and his environment live in harmony. The Bidul are unique, a reminder that each of us has a myriad of possibilities to create one's life and build a world. I went there for the rocks, and now I return there for the sensitivity of the souls that carved them. One day we will be back to our caves. You have to know that. Because uh, I think where you go is always, you go all around. 
your country is the best. And this is a place where I born. One day I wish, if I want to die, I will return and die in a cave. This is my life, yeah? That's it, yeah? Okay.